Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for being here and coming to the Silk Speaker Series. This is the, our first speaker of this year, and we have a doozy of a speaker tonight, which <laughs> I'll introduce in, in a second. Uh, my wife, Naomi, and I started the Silk Speaker Series so that we could bring top-notch, legendary finance people, investing people, leaders in business and finance to the University of San Francisco. And that would allow our students, which we have plenty of here tonight, to further their education of what they're learning in the classroom. That would also allow us to bring alumni back onto campus. And by doing those two things, we can better connect alumni to students. So thank you very much for, for being here tonight. We are lucky enough to have with us tonight Dr. Myron Scholes, who won a Nobel Prize in economic science in 1997. But before I go into the details of Dr. Scholes and tonight, I really want to recognize a couple people. And I, I first want to recognize Father Paul Fitzgerald, which is there's uh, right in front. Uh, as most of you know, Father Paul Fitzgerald is the president of the University of San Francisco. We are so very, very lucky to have his vision, his leadership, and he is so laser focused on making sure that you students get a wonderful, rich, and rounded education. Also, I want to recognize um, Dr. Dean or Dr. Elizabeth Davis, who is right in front of me. <laughs> Um, Dr. Davis is the Dean of the School of Management, and we are ever so lucky to have you here, uh, Dean Davis, and I thank you very much for your leadership, for the wonderful curriculums that you put together, for the fantastic professors that you assemble, and really focusing in on um, our students and making sure that their education is something that they can use for the rest of their life. Thank you very much for all of your service to the University of San Francisco. So, um, Dr. Scholes tonight is going to talk on the evolution of investment management. And he's going to talk for about 45 or so minutes. And then Professor Ludwig Cincaneri is going to run a QA. and a We got a bunch of questions from you all. And so uh, Ludwig has a whole bunch of questions. And then we'll spend time asking questions to uh, Dr. Scholes. That doesn't sound right. Can I, just, can, can I just say legendary Dr. Scholes or guru Dr. Scholes? And, and there's no cost. Anyways, pick, pick what uh, you want. <laughs> uh, Ludwig is a uh, professor here at the University of San Francisco, Tanisha's finance classes, uh, has a PhD in economics from MIT, uh, has a great work experience, is very knowledgeable in many areas of finance, and we are so lucky to have Ludwig as a professor here at the University of San Francisco. But we are even luckier to have uh, Dr. Myron Scholes speak here tonight to all of you, uh, a personal hero of mine. Dr. Scholes uh, has an undergraduate degree from uh, McMaster University in Canada, uh, has an MBA and a PhD from the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Scholes uh, has taught in the classroom at MIT, the University of Chicago, is currently the uh, Frankie Buck uh, Professor of Finance uh, Emeritus at uh, Stanford University for the Graduate School of Business. Uh, that's pretty impressive uh, list of credentials. But I don't know if I've mentioned this or not. Uh, Dr. Scholes won the Nobel Prize in economic science in uh, 1997 for his work on option pricing. Uh, and he won the Nobel Prize with uh, Fisher Black and with uh, Bob Mertens. Um, 
His work, if, if you've taken a finance class or a business class, you've studied the Black and Scholes model, the Black and Scholes option model. And this is the Scholes of the Black and Scholes <laughs> option model here at the University of San Francisco to speak to all of you. Anyways, um, it is an honor and it is a thrill and I thank you for speaking to all of us tonight here at the University of San Francisco. And with that, it is um, such a proud moment of mine to be able to introduce Dr. Myron Scholes. Um, yeah, I guess you can see that. Um, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. Um, I have uh, talked to you tonight um, about something that I'm very passionate about, and uh, I have uh, over, and I call it the evolution of investment management, and I call it the cost of constraints. And so it's going to be fascinating um, to listen because uh, I, I feel so uh, so. Um, close to this and so excited about what it is and uh, what it can do. So um, I will, um, I'll, I'll try to tell you uh, what it is, but it's going to be really in uh, two parts, okay, is the, um, that really uh, the way investment management has evolved over time is that we have initially first thought about the idea of evaluating performance of managers by saying what could we do naively so you just evaluate their performance relative to a um, relative to a benchmark and over time what has happened is that instead of saying let me just evaluate your performance relative to the benchmark that what I observe around the world when I go around the world and talk with endowment uh, endowment uh, endowments or others that uh, basically that the idea of staying close to a or just evaluating relative to benchmark has been the idea that we have what's called tracking error constraints which means that not only do you evaluate someone relative to benchmark but you constrain them to stay close to the benchmark and um, what, and so I've been, I have a paper that you can access fra, on my website at Stanford, or my pay, homepage at Stanford, which actually goes into consummate detail about this and does a lot of the active, uh, a lot of the uh, modeling and the empirical testing of it. But the idea is that when, uh, in life, when we have a constraint, and the interesting parts about constraints constraints themselves have a cost and then when there's a cost what do people do to mitigate the cost of the constraint and how they behave and when you mitigate something or try to uh, avert the constraint or act within the constraint then that might have an implicit cost in the sense of a lost return so today I'm going to talk about these implicit costs or lost returns in the dimension of having to stay close to a benchmark or having a tracking error constraint. And the second part, uh, which is not yet on my uh, homepage, which will be soon, is the idea of thinking about all investment has moved to the idea of how are we doing relative to someone else or how am I doing relative to a benchmark and that is not what investors are interested in. I know we don't eat relatives, you know, we might have them for dinner, but we don't eat them. <laughs> and so, but most of our life is really talking about what we want to do is maximize the value of our portfolio, maximize the value of investments we make, have the best terminal wealth experience that we can have, and subject to some type of drawdown constraint. We don't like to have large drawdowns because that means we have a loss. A drawdown in our portfolio value is a loss. And so we're interested in that. And uh, if we think about averages or average returns and the sharp ratios and everything we teach in school and class that permeates through the whole industry, not only in the United States, 
but around the world, Europe, China, uh, Asia, the rest of it, Japan, etc., then basically it leads to averages which are static when you think about averages and it has uh, also an implicit cost in terms of loss return. And so the interesting part of life or the part of investment is that the return, the distributions, the things we deal with are always changing. I mean, they're not constant or static over time. And this is very important to realize that. When we first started in the profession, we didn't have the data. Well, I didn't have the data. So it was easier just to assume distributions were normal and distributions didn't change. And when you assume that, that allowed you to have very wonderful results that were kind of simple. And even in the Black-Scholes model, you know, Fisher Black and I, we did the technology we allowed everything to change and very dynamic, and then we couldn't get a closed form solution. So that what we did is assume that the volatility was constant and that returns were normal, we distributed, log normally distributed in the compound sense. And, um, but those were only assumptions. So the interesting point is that my belief is we have to refocus our thinking away from average returns or average performance relative to a benchmark and go to compound returns. That's how the growth of your portfolio uh, changes over time. Not averages, not an average, okay? And I'll explain what they are. And compound returns really are most enhanced by not concentrating on the middle of the distribution. The middle doesn't mean anything. It's, uh, it's really fascinating. But all the ups and downs, the little ups and downs, forget them. They don't mean anything. We all concentrate on middle and the distribution, little ups and downs. Everything in investment is determined by the tails of the distribution. The tails are the extremes. The, and what I mean by the tails, it's not only the downside loss that you suffer, but in life, it's missing the good as well and the good is very important. So it's a combination of the down and the good. And basically, they have to figure out how to mitigate tail losses, the losses in the extremes, and participate in tail gains, the good, good ones as well. And the fascination about compound returns, it's each period of time. If you lose 90% this next period, it's gonna take a long time to come back. Each period counts. I start with 100 today, and I, uh, and I go over a period of time, and I, sorry, I lose 50% today in the first period, and I triple my money, I end up at 150. If I triple my money first, and I lose 50%, I still end up at 150. The order doesn't count. In compound returns, you're multiplying one plus the returns, so it's compounding over time and basically every period matters. And the interesting thing is then I realized, once again came to the idea compound return is crucial, every period matters, then where do I get information about the risk or the distribution of possible returns? And then I said, let me get information and believing in market prices, I believe that I can get information from the option market, not as to the mean, because the options under Black Shoals really are priced as if the expected return is equal to the risk-free rate, but I can get the distribution of risk relative to the assumption of the risk-free rate and how that distribution is changing each period of time. So I can look at the market and the market can tell me. So when you have a situation where uh, the market uh, price of protection of the, and the tails of the distribution are increasing, that means the insurance price is going up, the risk is going up. And you can take information and use that to enhance your compound return. The same way, when I was starting off in university, I used to drive home and just take the crowded freeway to get home. But nowadays, I crowdsource 
you know, I can use Waze and the information in the crowd tells me. And since risk, I'm going to show that the mean doesn't matter in returns. It really doesn't matter in dynamics of return. The most important thing is risk and the dimensions of risk and how risk are changing. That's what really uh, takes us in terms of thinking about things. And we have information about risk in the option market. The option market has a lot of information about how risks are changing because that's where people are actually buying protection about against risks. And it's very fascinating. So I've also had Philip Anderson quote about the tails of distribution. And uh, you know, as uh, Michelle Obama was talk uh, was taken by Mrs. Trump, I figured that Philip Anderson took some of my ideas as well, <laughs> and a physics guy. But the physicist and physics has it interesting, very interesting, because physics has myriad observations, you know, they can and run experiments. In economics and the like, we don't have that luxury because things are changing. They're not static, they're changing. And when things change, we can't look at huge long periods of time. You know, what happened in the 30s is not maybe germane to now, and so things are always changing. But um, they don't have market prices. The physicist doesn't have market prices. We have market prices, prices where people are actually buying protection and changing the risk and telling me what the risks are. So we'll talk about that and get back to that, okay? So I think really the future course, if I can talk about the evolution of asset management and thing, is to really maximize the terminal value of portfolios. Compound returns are crucial, not average returns. And also the, uh, using the fact that the distributions of risk are changing all the time. And uh, as a result of that, you end up with an ability to use information in the market to actually enhance returns. Another important fact that's very important, just to give you an illustration, that if you go over time, we always talk about cross-sectional diversification or the idea, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. When Tobin was awarded the Nobel Prize in economics, it was the case asked by the press for his one-liner. He said, I was awarded the Nobel Prize for saying don't put all your eggs in one basket, okay? So uh, that's cross-sectional diversification. Now, if cross-sectional diversification works, time diversification works too. And we only have one run of time. We can't cross-sectionally diversify in the sense that most of statistics is based on repetition or you know, the law of large numbers. You have a chance to get the average by completely resampling all the time Life is one run of time. We don't have n runs of time, you know, to get the average. So basically every period matters. And if you have a target level of risk, keeping your risk at target is so much, uh, as we'll show, is really free. If you can figure out ways to keep your risk at target, you don't hurt anyone else by doing it. If you allow your risk to fluctuate around target, your terminal value will be reduced. That's a fact. It's a mathematics. The mathematics of compound returns tell us everything. Okay? It's, the it's all mathematics. It has nothing to do with my intuition. It's just how compound returns work. And compound returns, as we'll, I'll show you in a few minutes, are really all a function of risk and how risks are changing. So if you can use the markets to tell you how to keep your risks at your target, you'll be much, much better off than allowing your risk to fluctuate around your target. So time diversification is keeping risks at your target level and not letting them fluctuate. And uh, I'll show you why in a moment or two. So as I say here, the mean of the distribution is, is your average return. You know, that's the different means in the distribution, but also there's different shapes. And when we deal with a normal distribution, or assume these shapes are constant over time and not changing, it's a whole different world from the world we live in where the distribution of risks are changing uh, quite dramatically. In 07, 08, the distribution of risks were far different from what they were, say, you know, uh, last year or this year. And, the, and uh, 
all of us are always uh, thinking in, in those different risks and how the risks are changing. So I think that basically relative return investing in how people evaluate themselves relative to others. Is, you know, I saw the movie The Titanic and uh, I saw that on the upper decks of the Titanic people were drinking champagne and uh, having a good time and unfortunately people on the decks below were drowning first. Uh, so relatively they were in good shape, but absolutely they weren't in very good shape because the boat was, was sinking. So you have to really think about uh, absolute returns are everything and not necessarily uh, relative as we tend to be forced to do things. So in asset pricing world, what I've been trying to think about is rational ways of thinking about why people impose tracking error constraints, staying close to a benchmark, having a residual error for the technicians here less than 5%, and may, it's to avoid potentially cheating and reducing explicit monitoring costs. In other words, if I can measure you uh, relative to others in a class or relative to anyone else uh, in other ways, then it, I don't have to work very hard. You know, I can just say, okay, how'd you do relative to this? And I can go home and not have to worry about how you do it. But I think that I found that there's a lost returns associated with that. Not, it's not free. And so the interesting thing in investment is how do you gain trust? How do you tr gain trust? How do you create trust among uh, the various individuals you manage money for? That trust is so crucial because the more trust you have, the more you can deviate from the benchmark. The more it allows you to trust you to be able to deviate from the benchmark. And it's a key issue. You know, the great investment houses that I've studied and worked with are the ones that are able to generate trust. But when you have trust, you have to use trust. You can't necessarily have trust and not use it in a productive way. And if you stick to the benchmark and never deviate or deviate very little from it, you'll have a, a really um, you know, lost returns and it has a, really a potential cost. So I have got a paper with Ashwin Alencar and Peter Blaustein, as I've said, on my, um, on my website. And um, that it reiterates what I said here about costs being high. And managers who manage money love to be able to have a benchmark constraint. Because the fascinating thing about active managers is when uh, they don't understand things, when you have shocks, when things get tough, they tend to diversify back to the benchmarks. So they go back to the safe harbor. Their safe harbor is the benchmark. Because then they say, oh, everyone else, is the benchmark went down, I went down, I'm perfectly the same as everyone else, so what, what should I have done differently? And you told me that you wanted me to stay close to the benchmark. So I think that um, you know, the tra we trade off explicit cost of evaluation, explicit cost of generating trust with that of thinking in terms of lost returns. So what we find is that with a tracking error constraint, the manager finances their active investments by using lower volatility stocks. What I mean by that is if a manager tends to love high risk stocks, medium risk stocks, and low risk stocks, how do they finance it? They would tend to finance it by those stocks that have the least and those stocks that have the least tracking error constraint are those that have lower volatility. You know, it's not going to have much effect on the benchmark. And two, stocks that are very highly correlated with the benchmark. So they're the ones they liquidate. And so what we find is that, uh, yes, that's what they do do, you know, and from our empirical work, they do do that. And uh, what that means is that they tend to overweight higher risk stocks in their portfolio to, and uh, underweight the lower risk stocks. But at times of shock, they completely reverse everything and go right back to the benchmark. Okay? Because what we find is that if you believe you're in something like I can, get, I can achieve extra returns, you want to have more invested in those classes. You get extra returns, but the greater the uncertainty of your extra returns, the less certain you are about your skill at that moment, then you tend to reduce your risk and bring it back to
to the benchmark. So we find that higher risk assets underperform, potentially as a result, and uh, which is consistent with the theory or the empirical evidence that, you know, so constraints do have an effect on portfolio performance. I just have here that lower volatility stocks tend to be um, uh, under, under weight in the uh, index, okay, 66 versus 56 percent. And for Ludwig, who said I watched, he wanted me to be very technical, I had this slide from our paper, and uh, this actually has all the mathematics of what I just said, but I'm not going to, I'm going to let him talk to you about that in the questions. Okay, so I'm going to skip this slide, but I think that I like to talk about ass allocation and the constraints are costly. One of the great things in investment, and you'll remember this if you want to be an investor in that, is if you can understand the constraints of others and you can figure out a way to mitigate the, those constraints, you can make money. Because what the investors are doing is paying you to take risks. They're paying you to take risks. And that paying you to take risks is the idea of understanding the constraints. In life, we talk about bargaining. We talk about the bargain is such, great bargains are such that the other party to the bargain gains something and I gain something. It's not as a current president of the United States thinks, it is that everything's a zero sum. You know, if I win, he loses, the art of the deal, okay? No, the bargaining game is both win. I win, the other party wins. And so the generalized bargain in investing, the anonymous bargain, is if you can know others' constraints, you can help mitigate those constraints. They'll be better off and you'll be better off by taking actions to do that. So I think that what we've had in our world is a constraint that basically asset allocation strategies have a common approach, which is actually a bench, uh, benchmark and tracking error. But what we find is that for many years, it's been that you have 60% stock and 40% bonds. That tends to be what uh, individuals talk about. Or when you're young, you should invest in equities, and when you get older, you should invest in bonds. Those are standard names, but they don't have any risk to them, and the glide path and the distinction is completely uh, arbitrary in the sense that the right question to ask is when you're young, how much downside risk are you willing to take when you're old how much downside risk you're willing to take how you build that portfolio might be very different at different times uh, because of the investment world that currently gives you these opportunities for example um, in 1980 uh, when I started investing uh, it was the case that bonds were yielding um, 14 or 16 percent, you know, and I thought maybe they were, even though I was young at the time, you know, it seemed like a good investment to me. Uh, today, for example, uh, the long bonds or intermediate, even 10, 20 year bonds don't seem like such a great investment to me, even though I'm old, you know, so um, I rather think in terms of risk and how to manage things. So I think that I, I really am trying to talk a lot to investment managers about dynamic risk management and how to do it. And I'll just describe that in the period and the time I have uh, left to go here. This is a fact about terminal wealth. And I know all of us want to get the best result, the best terminal wealth, you know, for a drawdown experience. And um, compound returns are always less than average returns. That's a fact. You know, the average return is always higher than the compound return by volatility. So I'll give you a simple example. You start hire someone today, and they make uh, uh, they uh, you um, you um, make 100 percent each period. Okay, so 100, 100 on average, you're making 100 percent. So if you make uh, the first period, you make 200 percent, and then the next period you make nothing, okay, on average you make 100%. Two divided by two is one, so both periods you make 100%. Both strategies. 
But on average, you have the same result, but no one would take the, or maybe they would, but you would not take basically the two, taking 200% this period because if you end up with um, three, uh, $1 goes to three and three times one getting your money back is three versus two times two is four. So the more volatility you take, the less your compound return is going to be. Okay, and also you think about it. Um, you have uh, on average, if you do averages, it ignores volatility. And if you have your friend uh, Peter and you're at the edge of the river, and Peter asks you uh, whether you can cross the river, and he tells you he can't swim. Uh, you say, don't worry about this, uh, Peter. On average, this river is only uh, two feet deep. And, uh, but Peter's pretty smart, you know, and he'll say, uh uh, what is the depth of the river right here? You know, and he says, it's 15 feet deep, it's different. So, you know, it's again, it's the average is very misleading, okay, in terms of how to deal with things. And basically, we have only one run of time, okay. So er, this Peter knows that the 15-foot part of the river is important to him at one run of time. And the averages or the idea of thinking about distributions really assumes we have the law of large numbers, which doesn't really apply if we have one run of time. And uh, so every period matters. And also, in the risk of return is much more important in the short run than in the longer run. We have the sharp ratio, which is the excess return that one realizes over uncertainty or volatility on an annual basis is about 0.3. Well, that's 30 units of reward for 100 units of risk. 30 units of reward for 100 units of risk. If you look at it over a monthly basis, then it drops to 7 units of reward for 100 units of risk. So that means risk tends to dominate in the short run. When you listen to the nuts on CNBC, you know, very few of them are talking about means or returns. They're all talking about volatility. They're all talking about risk. The market is going to collapse, they're going to go up. Okay? And so compound returns are asymmetric. Larger losses result. It takes you a long time to come back. As I said, I had a friend in, in 89 who asked, the J Japanese gentleman who asked me about his advisor said to invest in the stock market and he was going to retire in 2001. I said, well, you know, it's risky. You can't put all your money there. And he just, he's still working today uh, <laughs> uh, trying to get his money back. Um, so uh, allowing risk to fluctuate around average target reduces, re reduces uh, compound return. So if volatility is your enemy, excess volatility is your, also your enemy. You know, that means you're, if you have a target risk of uh, whatever volatility level, if you allow your risk to fluctuate around that target, it'll reduce your compound returns. So skewness is important for compound return. Everyone loves upper tails of distribution. They don't like lower tails. So basically, that affects compound returns. And uh, it's really tail losses and tail gains are the most important. Uh, I found this cartoon here about the two guys who uh, one sold at the top of the market and the other one bought at the, uh, bought at the top and the other one sold at the bottom. And so they're asking for money from others. Uh, and uh, this I just showed you here that if you keep this, it's interesting. Let's say you take the S&P 500, and, which is an index of returns. So that's a common thing you hear about the Dow Jones or the S&P 500. So people say, okay, it's the S&P index is no cost, no fees, and no tracking error. So it's, it's great, right? You buy a passive investment, but it's not risk managed. Okay, so say the average risk of the S&P 500 is 0.15%, 15%, and today it's 20% uh, volatility or extra risk. You say, oh, 20%, great, you know, I can, uh, that means I'm going to make a higher return. So I say you make 20% return when it's 20%, 15% when it's 15%, and then you say, oh, okay, that's great, and so it compensates me. And if it's 10% risk, I make 10%, which is fine. 
But the difficulty is that the risk is changing over time and your average return is the same as if you kept your risk constant. And what you can show mathematically is that if you have, even though the expected return is the same because you've taken excess volatility, you reduce your compound return and that's free. So managers, when you're managing your money, don't allow your risk to fluctuate if you can have ways to know how to mitigate it and keep risks at target. Now the interesting thing is, and what really is fascinating and got me to really think about the tails of the distribution, are that, let's say from Roger Ibbotson's data that in 1857 you invested in the stock market and large cap stocks in the United States, then your compound return, your excess comp return would have been 5% over this whatever risk-free rate you wanted to uh, use uh, during that period of time. So that's a compound return of 5%. Let's say that you were very lucky person and you went on a vacation maybe once every four and a half years and being a lucky person you sold all your stocks okay, out for that one month and repurchased them at the end of that one month and once every four and a half years since 1857 then that was the two and a half percent of the worst performing months over that period of time and then your compound return would have been 9%. So 5% versus 9% is astronomical because $1 grows to $3,000 at 5%. $1 grows to 1,003,000 okay, at 9%. And conversely, if you were a very unlucky person and sold all your stocks out for the one month and they happen to be the uh, best performing months, your compound return would only be 1%. So $1 goes to eight. So you're talking about one versus eight, one versus 3,000, and one versus a million three. Okay, all of the returns are exp explained by the tails of the distribution, not by the middle. The middle is a lot of random noise. And so everyone who focuses on the middle of the distribution of possible returns, what are they going to do with this? What is 2%, 1%? That is misdirected. You have to focus on the tails. You know, what could be the bad things or what can be the good things that affect what I'm going to do? So look at the Mayweather-McGregor fight. If you look at great boxers, you know, I just put this in. But what it is, all the little jabs, a great box, don't worry about it. the jocks are jabs, jabs, you know, nothing, okay? It's really trying to figure out how to defend yourself against those jabs, but they're not very meaningful. But it's, and it's really, you know, being willing to uh, be able to avoid the hit that's going to kill you or to participate in those things which are going to uh, make your uh, opponent uh, surrender. And here, you know, it's to show the distribution of returns are not normal. Uh, far from it, tail events are very frequent. This is uh, bootstrap from 19, um, 1960 uh, to um, 2015. And the number of incidents of tails is much greater than what you'd ever expect in, uh, uh, from a normal distribution, okay? So how do we get tail risks and how do we measure it? And there's a paper, there's a bunch of papers in, in academics, but one is Poon and Granger, and Granger was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics, which really say all this back data, looking historically at things, okay, looking, you know, a lot of what we do in economics and macro policy and everything is we drive our cars by looking in the rear view mirror, you know, and so we, look, we explain things perfectly from the past by looking in the rear view mirror, but it doesn't tell us much about where the car is going to go, you know. And so Poon and Granger did the studies and said that options are really the best estimate of, uh, of uh, returns. And I am say in what we have to do if we're interested in the tails of the distribution, let's get information not from the option market about the middle of the distribution so much, let's get, let's get information about the tails of the distribution. 
And an out-of-the-money put option uh, insures you against large losses. Now, the interesting thing about out-of-the-money options, that's the ones that are, you know, have strike prices that are, uh, are, um, are low relative to, uh, in a put sense, relative to the current market price, is that um, you have a buyer and a seller. And if there's a person who's making a market or selling protection or selling insurance, it's akin to Darwinian survival of the fittest. You can't sell options for a very long period of time at the wrong price and be able to survive. You'll soon go broke. It's a very levered market, okay? And so um, basically, uh, if you're gonna survive, they're setting prices given what the market is saying. And those people who wanna buy protection can't buy protection without doing something, like buying something. So market prices are revealing and market prices are very powerful. And that's what we see a lot in the development of economics and finance over the years, is how market prices are telling us more and more about what's going on. We're trading individual things, okay, in that. So it's the, it's the dark blue and the light green that are really the tails of the distribution that are very interested in how you manage money and how you get things. So the way I get the distribution of forward risks in the market are basically to look at the options, okay? So there's three options I depicted here. And every option, a lot of the, like the S&P 500, might have 20 or 30 options that are traded, each one at different strike prices and each one with a different price. And from the option price, one can determine the volatility. Once you determine the volatility, it tells you the distribution. So there's the red distribution is the out of the money put options and the light Blue distribution is the out of the money call options, which are the tails on the upside, and the black is the middle distribution. And we have those three distributions. And what we can do is with a bunch of distributions, as Litzenberger, Breeden, and Litzenberger showed in a paper, and um, also uh, Figlewski showed and, uh, under the Black Scholes technology that what you can do is by taking the second derivative of the exercise price, you can stitch these together, all these distributions. So you start off with the conditional out of the money option being the red distribution, and then you move them to the stitching to the middle of the distribution, which is the black, and then you move to the blue, which is the upper part of the distribution, and you can compute the tail loss, say the 10% of the worst cases, and the 10% of the uh, best cases. So that's the upper tail of the distribution. So one of the things about the option market, it gives you pictures every day of what the distribution of risks are. Now, there's not much liquidity in options or valuation, not a very thick market for longer dated options, but it's terrific for two month options or three month options and options are traded now on over 4,000 securities and instruments around the world. So every day I can know what the price of gold options are or the distribution of gold risk or silver risks or uh, DAX risk or FTSE risk or the S&P 500 risk, everything, okay? And um, the interesting part about risk as well is that times are shock that growth assets or all assets tend to become somewhat redundant because when something's going down in the tails, everything's going down. And similarly, when things are going up, they're all going up. It's the middle of the distribution, which is very hard to know what the correlations would be. So yeah, you get here, just think about doing a dynamic uh, 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 tail-based sharp ratio uh, uh, optimization. I heard that Professor Markowitz may be coming to give a talk and he uh, is talks about mean variance. Maybe he uh, will say you just can't use historical data as well. But um, then, so basically if you look at, this is a bootstrap distribution that looks at the idea of using the information in the option market. If you think about just uh, a 60-40 portfolio of asset holdings, that standard benchmark that universities use and everyone tends to use is the average, you find that the, on a one-year basis, the compound returns are 
are quite similar, but the ones where you use the information in the, in the option market, you get the blue distribution. But notice that when you manage your money, you want to say, if the risk of downside is increasing, I want to reduce my risk. If the risk of upside is decreasing, I want to increase my risk as given by the market. And then you can mitigate the tails of the distribution instead of losing 40% uh, or so, or 30%, you lose 18 or so percent. But that is a huge effect. By cutting the tails and having money to participate in the upside, then you get over a five-year compounding period, then you get the blue distribution shifts dramatically to the right because the power of compounding really takes over. Saving some of the downside. If you can save 50% of the downside and participate in 70 or 80% of the upside, you'll have a, just a wonderful return experience. And that the markets are telling you these information. I've done nothing. I have no model other than just taking the information as a reporter and using that what it is from the option market. And here in the last slide I have just to show you what happens just with the S&P 500 alone, the Standard & Poor 500, risk managing it. Nothing about means, because the means are not really that important, just mat moving the, uh, based on the risk, either the skewness risk or the downside risk, trying to keep my risk at target and managing it on skewness. Uh, from 1996 to 2015, you see in the red distribution is the actual Standard & Poor 500, the blue distribution is what you'd expect by using the option market information. And then you have, uh, instead of losing 50% in two times over the last, since 1996, one when the dot-com bubble occurred in 2001, and two in 2007 08 when you dropped 50%, you can cut your losses to 25% at the time, but then participate in the upside. So here, you got a slightly greater mean. But when you let it compound, the idea of letting it, uh, cutting your downside and participating in the upside in the bootstrap, what I mean by a bootstrap is you have one year sequence of returns, you throw it into an urn, another one year sequence, another one year, another one year, and overlapping, you throw it into an urn and you uh, sample 10,000 times and see what the distribution looks like. Uh, it's the only way I can tell when you have distribution change in shape to be able to show the effects of actually uh, compounding and compound returns over time. You see that on uh, average uh, in the red distribution, you can lose over a five-year period, you could lose 12% with some probability or 5% per year with some probability. But if you manage your risk, just risk management alone, not be constrained to just hold the passive portfolio, but to risk manage it, you make great returns. So the future really is two things. One is thinking about active management. Can I outperform? Do I have skills to outperform? Which is the alpha world or the ability to outperform. But just as important, any anchor portfolio you have, that there's the risk managing or the beta part is important. So everyone who's just concentrating on outperforming a benchmark, the act of passive debate, is insufficient relative to thinking about, yeah, I can do that, but I can do much better by clapping with the second hand, which is risk managing my portfolio over time. If you ignore risk management, you're, you're not really managing money correctly. You're not thinking about your future. So it's not the mean, it's not the middle distribution. I think focusing on that is not as important as really thinking about how risk evolve over time. When the opportunity set in life or in what your investments is gives you a great positive tail relative to a negative tail, that's when you should invest very heavily, right? And also, over time, not allow the risk of what you do to fluctuate dramatically because that reduces your expected experience on a compound return sense or a compound value sense. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. God, this is loud. 
Thank you very much. Uh, that, that's actually very exciting. And uh, where can people get the details? Uh, is the paper on your website if they want to get the details? First, yeah, the first half is on my website about the relative value one and the mathematical equation that you told me to put up is on it. And the, <laughs> the second one I'm writing up at the current moment and I'll have that available soon. Okay, great. Before we start the Q&A, and some of these questions came from uh, the audience and other people, I want to tell you two quick stories uh, uh, about our guest speaker. So the first story is when I was in graduate school, I had taken a lot of these famous guys, Paul Krugman and other people, general equilibrium theory, and I was utterly depressed. And I went into my office and I was getting ready to take Merton's course at Harvard, and I picked up this book and I started reading about Black Shoals. And it literally changed my life. And I really mean that. It was the first time I said, something really works. And, um, and it was a life-changing moment. And I actually flew to New York and knocked on Fisher Black's door and say, I need a job. I would have gone to your office, but you were further away. <laughs> the second story is when uh, Myron invented with Fisher Black uh, the Black Shoals pricing model. This is 1973. And right at that time, by coincidence, the CBOE started trading options on the exchange, so it was good timing. And Hewlett Packard, being sort of a leading company, decided to put on their calculator a function that would calculate the implied ball from option prices. So traders could use them to trade options. So um, Myron and Fisher called Hewlett Packard and said, hey, you know, it's our model, uh, are we gonna get a royalty from this. And uh, Hewlett Packard said, well, you published the paper, it's in the public domain, so legally we don't have to pay you anything. They said, okay, thanks. <laughs> then they picked the phone back up and said, could we at least get a free calculator? <laughs> and HP said, go buy one at the local store. <laughs> That's a true story. Well, it actually was Texas Instruments. Sorry, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to belittle. Uh, okay, HP is a great HP, company. H, not, not HP. <laughs> Texas Instruments. Sorry about that. <laughs> They're both allowable for the CFA. Uh, so let's start the questions. Um, so let's go back to 1973. Uh, you and Fisher Black were working together at MIT, and there's been some writings on Fisher Black going into a secret black cabinet and other things. Can you tell us a little bit about? how those times were and how you guys collaborated and when you had that moment of, oh, we figured it out. Um, I don't know if there's necessarily uh, the classical eureka moment, you know, it's, it's a lot of hard work, you know. We had the actual uh, technology uh, in place for about two or three years and we were trying to get a general solution without having it be constrained to a model. So our technology was a differential equation that allowed us to, uh, uh, to value, make various things. Not volatility can change, you know, the, uh, the interest rate structure can change, the state variables can change. But, so we tried to figure out how to do a general solution and we uh, couldn't do it. That's when we decided we better do this in terms of a model, which makes some assumptions which are incorrect, but get you a long way to describe what's happening, namely that the volatility was constant and the interest rate was constant. But uh, So it took us a long time to actually work on this. We worked in private and together, and we were doing other things at the same time, other papers and that, so we come back to it and talk with each other about it, and, uh, and um, it was exciting. I, I didn't really realize, I, I thought at the time we did it, which would enable us to price bonds, you know, and things, existing instruments like options, but I never saw that how once you have technology or once you have a model, a way to do things, that it enables um, the investment bankers or those in the street to actually build whole new things, you know, that uh, never existed and never, and, and basically all evolution of um, in finance and other businesses is try to satisfy individuals as opposed to provide products, okay? And the investment banking world uh, prior to um, when, I, uh, when I started off was one of having products. So you'd have a banker would issue a product and sell that product to someone else and um, they realized with the technology and the modeling that we had developed 
that you could act as a principal so that you wouldn't have to find Jones and Smith. You'd say, what does Jones want? You know, then I can give something Jones want, and then what does Smith want? I can produce something Smith wants, and then I can figure out how to hedge these risks or to price them using technology that exists. So it made things individualized. Instead of having one shoe fit all, fits all, you can now make it shoes that fit me or shoes that fit someone else. I never realized all that was going to happen, but it then strikes you that if you have technology that enables you to do things that are different from, um, that it gives you a map or a way to do things which are far superior. So at the time when Fisher and I were working on this, well, we had started working on this because in finance we had there are sort of the three things that were talked about as risk management were one is stocks and bonds. So that you can reduce your risk by holding more cash or more bonds, right? That was, that was one risk dimension. The second risk dimension was diversification, which I talked about. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, you know, and that was the second thing. But there was this thing out there called insurance, you know, out there and, and uh, insurance. So I became fascinated with how do we price insurance? You know, insurance was different because it's non-linear. You know, sometimes the insurance is more valuable, or sometimes it's less valuable, and it's it's a function of uh, how much in or out of the money you are at any particular time. So it, I, I became interested in that, and, and uh, Fisher had uh, also become interested in it from a different perspective. And then we, in doing other things we were doing together, we started talking about it, and he had some ideas. I got stuck in certain ways I was dealing with, he was stuck in the ways he was dealing with it, so we married our thinking together, and, and we then grew very dramatically, and we kept working and working on this. So we didn't tell Merton who, uh, or Samuelson, who had worked on option pricing, we kept it in our drawer. You know, it's one thing about protection, you want to protect what you have until you can't, and then you, I shouldn't, and then the real question about people ask me a lot, why don't you just use it for yourself? Why did you publish it? Well, it's one thing, when you know a route, before you know a route through the forest, you know, you can say, oh, I'm not going to tell anyone, I'm going to use it myself. But once you figure out what the route is, then you say, oh my God, if I can figure it out, others can figure it out as well. So you have a choice in life. Either you publish it, and you get accolades for publishing something, but then it's a free good, everyone in life could use it, or you hold it to yourself and someone else publishes it, and then they claim basically that, uh, that um, you know, then others, you pu others publish, and then you can claim all you want, but it's too late at that time. Like Darwin, right, he wrote for years and years and years, he did all these studies and didn't uh, publish, and then this other guy, I think it was, was it Walker or someone who had, um, or um, was going to publish, but then he said, no, Darwin had discovered first, you know, and he allowed Darwin to have the accolades. But so you got to think of science, you know, we always knew we were going to publish it, but, the, but we didn't want to tell um, the co competitors too quickly, but um, they initially said uh, no, they didn't believe what we were as correct in that, and but after a while, we convinced them I was correct, and then they went off and did it uh, as well. And how has your life changed since uh, you won the Nobel Prize? Well, I tell people if you get the opportunity to receive the Nobel Prize, don't turn it down. <laughs> <laughs> anything special, though? Anything? anything uh, what did you think about Fisher Black not making it? Because. Well, I, he did not make it. I mean, I felt badly, but he passed away, and basically in 1995. And a person is not awarded the Nobel Prize posthumously. You can, it's a very special case. You can be awarded the Nobel Prize, die before you receive it in that six weeks, okay, and then you still are given the honor. But you have to be alive to be awarded the prize. But it was very clear in the accolade, you know, in the citations and that, that he conditional. It, he would have won and been awarded the Nobel Prize if he had lived to do it. So I felt badly that he was not a recipient. So those days at MIT... But I made more yeah. money. I made more money. But. <laughs> <laughs>
those days at MIT were super creative, and it's not always too easy to create a, a creative environment. For example, some people think free speech is under attack today. But I guess my question to you really is, um, what advice do you give to others to create and foster a creative environment so ideas can, can be born? Right. Well, what I, what I say to people, which is, I say, go where the best are. Go where the best are and steal everything you can from them. <laughs> I really mean that seriously. But the point is, to go where the best are and steal from them, they gotta be able to steal from you. So you gotta go, you gotta be the best too. So everything in life, you wanna be the best for you, which is the group that's the best for you, that you can create the most and learn the most, you know, and from. And if you're not learning from the group you're with, leave, right? If you are, uh, learning and growing and that, then stay, you know. So that's, that's what I have learned. And when I was in MIT, you know, I, uh, with trepidation, you know, I'm a young nothing guy, it's just starting off and then talking with Paul Samuelson or Solo or Medigliani or, um, you know, Bob Merton came after I was there, but other uh, great people um, or in other things when I was at Chicago to be able to work with uh, Merton Miller who, was awarded the Nobel Prize, so my mentor was awarded the Nobel Prize, and then uh, Gene Fama, who I also was with, was awarded the Nobel Prize. So it's basically, um, you know, steal as much as you can. You know, it's, it's, uh, I really mean that. I, I think it's not bad, you know, it's one thing, uh, uh, I don't understand why we said don't copy other people, you know. It's uh, mimicking what other people have done, trying to understand, listen to them is great. You know, having to do everything yourself is impossible in life. And, being able to do that is very good. But you have to realize you gotta push yourself if you're the best, you know, if you wanna go and get from the best, you gotta be for them the best as well. And they gotta, or else find a new group. Who was, uh, you mentioned some names there. Who was a mentor of yours? And can you s describe the greatest lessons that they taught you? And what are the greatest lessons you have taught your students? <laughs> I wish I had taught them some great lessons, but <laughs> the, um, yeah, I guess for me, I was, um, I, I was in uh, my first year at University of Chicago, I um, saw a sign taking, said, computer programmer needed, okay, and so I, um, this is for a summer job, and I didn't know uh, anything about what a computer did in those days, not like you guys have all your computers in your pocket, and that, you know, the big mainframe machine that couldn't do very much of anything, so I went to, the dean, and I said, can I have this com one of the computer programming job? And he said, um, well, yeah, I mean, you're number seven. I said, I don't know anything about a computer. He said, you're number seven. And the first day in the office, no one other than myself showed up. By the third day, I was the only guy there, and the professors were all coming around wanting research help, you know, in programming. And so uh, I went to the dean, and I said that, um, you know, where's the other six guys? You know, and they, said, they didn't show up. They didn't never, no one showed up with me. So basically, I didn't know anything about a computer and I was a computer programmer and no one else to be there to shirk. I couldn't shirk at all. So I became a computer nerd that summer. But what I did was, I was amazed at how the professors loved their research. You know, Merton Miller or Peter Pashigian or, or Lester Telser or Gene Fama who came in and asked for my help. I said, they love their research as much as that. That's for me, you know, basically it must be good. You know, the guys who love their research. So I said, okay, at the end of the summer, they told me, they said, well, I said, why don't you, the professor said, why don't you go in the PhD program and get your PhD? And I didn't know whether it was because of my programming ability or because they might have thought some ideas were good for them in terms of things. But I never, they gave me a fellowship, scholarship, money, and everything. And that was, that was uh, serendipitous, just luck, you know, that I, but it was, to me, is realizing, again, this stealing thing or mimicking, you know, realizing what really intrigued other people, what they loved, and if you can figure out what they love, why could you love that? You know, if I loved economics and that, so it was there. And what I've tried to give to my students is really, there's, there's research in life, researching what other people have done. Going and research, that's what research is, you know, adding an I and a T. It's a wonderful part of science and life. But I said, you gotta have some things in your life where you're searching, 
you know, don't be trapped by what others have done. Search for other things. Search for new creative things. Don't think that I have to be vertical, you know, go right so deep into things that I don't see the path to the right or the left. You know, just don't down that narrow focus. So I've encouraged my students, my PhD students and others in that to do some searching. You know, don't worry if initially you're not going to exactly figure out what's going on. And I think that's important to, you know, balance those things and to be able to figure out how to search in addition to do research. I think uh, uh, there's, uh, unfortunately, the academic world, which I was in for a long time and probably even true in other worlds, really only rewards you if you have publications. And so when you get your PhD thesis, you try to do something the professor is interested in. You know, hedge your bets and do that. And um, so it creates too much uh, vertical uh, activity and not enough horizontal. We're going looking at the right or left. Related to that, is there something a family member of yours has taught you that has served you well in your lifetime? Well, yes. I mean, um, uh, my mother passed away when I was uh, 15, and, uh, you know, in the years prior to her death, I spent a lot of time talking with her, and uh, it uh, gave me a, a different perspective on life. And let me say that, you know, life is short, and you've got to take risks. You've got to think about what makes you go, as a per me as a person, and what I'm interested in. And don't worry if you fail. You know, uh, the objective is know yourself and go back to your principles of yourself. And don't, don't cheat. I'm not saying, you know, don't be a cheater in that. And, but understand that uh, you only have, uh, you know, paraphrasing what I said earlier, you only have one run of time. Okay, now we're going to move to finance questions, um, but before we start that, um, I'm going to mention some people that were influential in economics and finance and just get your uh, one sentence or first thought that comes to your mind on each person. Fisher Black. Uh, Fisher Black was uh, just a great inspiration for me and, uh, you know, I learned a tremendous amount from him because he came from a completely different perspective than I did. He came from a physics background, uh, you know, uh, to start with and uh, didn't know economics. So basically, I knew economics and I married together his thinking on physics and mine and I think we had a much greater result as a result of that collaboration. Bob Merton. Bob Merton's, you, you, you had Bob Merton here, so you know what he is. He's a very wonderful fellow and uh, very creative. And uh, I, again, I've learned a lot working with him and being with him. A good friend. Merton Miller, who was your advisor? Uh, Merton Miller was tremendous. I mean, he's, um, he, um, uh, we were on a PhD committee together, and a PhD candidate took 21 years to get his PhD, <laughs> and, and Merton stayed with him the entire time. <laughs> he's, a, he's a real scholar, you know, it's interesting. He, uh, he uh, was very, well, he's actually started off as a history of economic historian before he went into finance, but, uh, you know, a terrific, uh, terrific person. It's a pleasure for me to have, wor having worked with him and written papers with him. So um, recently, Steve Ross died, who was a big person in finance. Steve Ross. Steve Ross is, was great. I mean, he uh, he came into the profession uh, from Caltech after uh, starting uh, in a different area, and you know, he like you, uh, I I love Steve because he said like you, he really thought finance was terrific once he started thinking about reading about options and thinking about that. But he did some very, very creative work in, uh, especially with arbitrage pricing theory. And, you know, it, when someone does things that you didn't think about and you say, I wish I could think about those, have done it that way, then, uh, you know, that, I clap to that person. Give claps to that person. Gene Fama, another one of your advisors. Yeah, Gene also, I mean, Gene is terrific empiricist. I mean, it was wonderful to watch the way he, 
loved doing research and the data and uh, working with data and how he uh, persisted and his work ethic was unbelievable you know he uh, got in the morning was always there before I was and he always was home after I was and he ended up having four children. I don't know how he did that. <laughs> <laughs> so putting you on the spot a little bit, Fisher Black used to call, and he's I think written publicly about it, he called Gene Fama a data miner. Do you have a reaction to that? Um, well, I could, uh, yeah, I, I think that um, all of us data mine, okay? The interesting thing about science is that we're all inductive. You know, I don't think we can be deductive without cheating, if you want to think about data mining, by looking at history or looking at things. So we look at history and then we build a model based on history. And then, unfortunately, we go back and test the model exactly on the data which we developed our thinking from. So, but that's all science. I mean, science, you know, I don't know if anyone could do something purely from, without ever looking at anything in history or looking at anything that would uh, change their views about, would, um, sorry, fashion their views. So if you think about, it, that's the wonderful parts about science, that's the wonderful part about our creativity, because we know we data mine, we know that the information set is gigantic and we take a piece of that information set, we build a model and then we try to go test it and then we use the data. So that's what we have, that's our life, okay? We, can't, we don't have a, a way to just be deductive. So if you are inductive, then the great scientist or the creative person is either lucky and they, didn't, they took the correct data or they know what data to gather and when to stop. And I've seen many people who've gathered too little data from the past, and I know so many other people who just kept gathering data and kept gathering data and never deduced anything. So the, cre the genius or the creative person is to data mine or be inductive, but know when to see something different and to be able to create something which is very valuable. So I don't necessarily think data mining is bad. I think big data and all the things we're going to do, you just have to be know how to be creative using it and when it, what it tells you what you can't do and what it tells you it does do. Okay, we have a couple more people and then we'll get to the other questions. Harry Markowitz. Harry Markowitz, I um, didn't know Harry Markowitz very well. Har Harry Markowitz obviously is sort of the father of uh, portfolio theory and uh, I read his books as a student, you know, read his work as a student. And as, just very creative, you know, so I have, that's, I'll stop there. Okay, um, I'll, I'll move on to some of the questions. Black Scholes was probably one of the most important discoveries in finance and economics. What other discovery do you think is of that magnitude? None. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, obviously in, ec in economics, okay, that was, how to price uncertainty. Obviously, that idea that market prices, deciding that market prices are the key thing, one of the key things in economics, you know, going back to Marshall and uh, obviously to Adam Smith were wonderful discoveries in that. You know, I mean, in those, there's, there's just more, there are many fundamental things, but that was one of them that's really crucial. And today, what do you think, uh, what is missing uh, in economics uh, that people should be focusing on? Uh, there's lots of things that we have yet to do. I mean, I think we really only broached the surface of how to think about uncertainty. We need whole, all new models of macro. Macro models are all broken. They're based on uh, bad theory, and I don't mean to knock anyone's profession here in macro, but in, ma in my own thinking of it, it we're all based on certainty models, you know, and, and the like, and that basically we have to think about how uncertainty comes in right from the start, you know, and build models again from the ground up and, and uh, work that way. So we have a lot of work to do with macro. You know, macro, macro models didn't have anything about finance in it until 2007, 2008, you know, and they had it based on frictions and things like that. And, and our micro world, you know, is all based on frictions again. The idea that we've seen nothing 
yet in terms of how it's going to be, economics is going to change with the idea of the internet and big data and robotics and that, you know, and, and all that's going to change. And, and um, you know, we have, and also we haven't really had great political economics anymore. We split political economics into politics and economics and with the advent of Asia and the politics or the philosophy of the East versus economics and the politics and philosophy of the West, you know, how are they going to mesh together when we have a world that's getting smaller and smaller and what is that going to do in terms of how this economics is going to evolve over time? So there's huge amounts of research and thinking to do and are we going to end up in a, in a clash between the China and the West, in the West and the U.S., you know, because our philosophy is so different from their philosophy and our economics are coming together and clashing quite dramatically. So there's lots of different things that in my remaining 63 and a half years I'm going to work on. <laughs> okay, one more question, then we're going to go to the dean to ask the last question. Out of all your accomplishments, what are you most proud of and why? And this can even include personal accomplishments uh, instead of profession. Well, other than my um, having uh, two wonderful daughters and uh, four grandchildren, I, um, you can see that I, you know, I relish the, them and legacy, so I'm consuming through them, which is really terrific. So, um, but um, I think that uh, I think one of the things that accomplishment I like um, about myself is that I, I, I love learning or trying to learn new things. And uh, so that to me is a good accomplishment because I think if you know everything, you know, I think you know nothing. And so uh, I keep trying to learn. And, so I, and since uncertainty has been my, my uh, benchmark of like trying to understand uncertainty or get uncertainty, it's allowed me the freedom to read very broadly from history to history of war to politics to philosophy and other things and uh, you know, to see how other people think about our physics, mathematics, you know. Um, and so uh, that I just felt my being lucky and wanting to understand uncertainty or really think about uncertainty is, you know, for me is a good accomplishment. Okay, thanks. Uh, why don't we give the last question uh, to Dean Davis? Thank you. Lovely. So this was this was really difficult. Um, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Um, but. Tonight is very much about the education of our students. So I get to ask the last question of the night. And I have to tell you, as I was sitting in the audience, I thought this might be risky, a little bit <laughs> risky, Good. to ask you this last question. But I actually knew that you would not give an average response <laughs> to my question. <laughs> so I ask you uh, to really, as you reflect on your career and the different experiences uh, you've had, and you've given us some insight into this question, what advice would you give to our students to best prepare them for future success in life and their careers? Man, that's uh, presumptuous. I, I, uh, for me to answer that, I think that um, basically, uh, you know, look, um, look after your bodies, <laughs> look after your heart, keep learning, and. Uh, realize that um, uh, you have uh, learning as a lifetime experience and that you have to really think about uh, um, learning as much you can in any particular way that you can and it's fun. I think, you, I, I think if you keep learning it keeps you young. You know, I find that uh, for me it's, uh, I'm very old but I try to uh, keep learning and as that part of my life is very important. So learn from your fellow students, you know, and, and uh, realize and 
And interestingly enough, I mean, I, um, talking about this earlier, someone asked me a question earlier, but how we learn and how it's so different for different people, and so you have to figure out how you learn and how the best model of how you learn. And I learn in a particular way, other people learn in another way. When, before I, Ludwig I know is a great golfer, I didn't tell him this, but I, uh, before I even swung the club once, I read 141 golf books on how to, <laughs> how to play golf. So I learned in different ways, you know. But I, I still, when I, unfortunately, when I tried to swing the club after the 141 books, the, <laughs> the ball didn't do what I thought it was going to do. <laughs> Maybe stealing a few techniques, too. From well, the I try to steal from the techniques from the books, but... <laughs> so, in life, Okay, theory is what I'm trying to say is theory is important. You know, the books are important, theory is important, but experience is important too. So how do you marry theory and experience together in the right way and how to do it is very important. So just don't, won't be, don't be experiential because that's not, that's good, but not the way to do it. Don't be just theory because that's not good. So, um, you know, I think the combination of both are important. So in your educational things, you're giving a theory but remember that professors don't have enough experience. You have to figure out how to get the experience either from your students or others to be able to make it a richer environment. Great. Thank you so much. You're Staring welcome. both Jeff and Naomi for making this possible, this event uh, in the Silk Speaker Series. Uh, for those of you who've been here before, you know that we started this uh, back in the spring. This is the first in the series of the fall. Uh, please mark your calendars for October 18th when we'll have Magic Johnson here uh, on campus. Uh, but watch for our notices and thank you all for coming tonight. You're so welcome. Much. Appreciate it. Really enjoyed that.